Welcome, my beautiful people, to another episode of Dino Basics, where we dig up the basics on some of our favorite deceased beasts. My name is Logan, and today, we look into the basics on the feisty little forest dweller. Thank you to Running Firewater 5582 for today's topic, the Dryosaurus. The earliest remains of Dryosaurus can be credited to paleontologist Samuel Wendell Williston in 1876, discovered in the modern-day United States, specifically the state of Wyoming. After the excavation of this fossil, which included a fairly intact body and remarkably complete skull, naming and describing the fossil would fall to renowned paleontologist Othniel Charles Marsh in 1878, who rather than creating a new genus, instead described the creature as a species of an existing genus called Laosaurus, creating the new species Laosaurus altus. This designation would not last for long, however, as in 1894, Marsh would revisit Altus and decide to assign the species to a new genus of dinosaur, named the Dryosaurus altus. Over the following years, additional specimens would be found across the western United States, including states like Utah and Colorado. The genus would remain largely unchanged until 1972, when museum curator Rodney Sheets and his family would discover an extensive bone bed with remarkably intact fossils. The family would return to this site for nearly 20 years until 1991, when a note would be published describing what was recovered. The family would uncover almost 2,500 fragments from the site, with what was believed to be eight individuals all from the Dryosaurus genus. These individuals varied in age, from juvenile all the way to embryonic, an exceptionally rare find for dinosaurs. Twenty years later, paleontologist Gregory S. Paul would suggest that these recovered remains could be a new species of Dryosaurus. This conclusion would be supported by paleontologists Kenneth Carpenter and Peter Galton, who would declare the new species Dryosaurus elderae. This was not the only species declared for Dryosaurus, however, as throughout the 20th century, various other species would be assigned to the genus, but all would later be redesignated as completely new genus. In 1975, for example, the English Valdosaurus was described as a new species of Dryosaurus called Dryosaurus canalicolidus, before being changed to a distinct genus in 1977. Similarly, the Tanzanian Dicelodosaurus would be declared as a distinct genus in 1919, but would often be grouped into the Dryosaurus name, until a 2010 study shined more light on the genus and cemented Dicelodosaurus as a distinct genus. The name Dryosaurus directly translates from Greek, including the word soros for lizard, a common ending in dinosaur names. The prefix dries, meaning tree or oak, is not as straightforward. Some sources claim this naming was based off of the oak leaf-shaped teeth in their cheeks. While there is certainly a resemblance, it is more likely this name was chosen to reflect the forested environment this dinosaur would inhabit. The species names, by comparison, are a bit easier to explain. The type species Altus directly translates to tall, which references when Dryosaurus was still considered a species of Laosaurus, as Dryosaurus fossils were generally taller than other species of Laosaurus. Elderae seems to honor fossil technician Anne Elder, who worked on various specimens of Dryosaurus for years before her death. Dryosaurus was a member of the Ornithischian, or bird-hipped, dinosaur grouping. And more specifically, Dryosaurus is the namesake of its own family of dinosaurs, known as the Dryosauridae. But this hasn't always been the case. 
early classifications of this creature believed Dryosaurus and other Dryosauridae members to belong to a different family, the Hypsilophodonts. A classification of superficially similar dinosaurs, including the namesake Hypsilophodon. However, later classifications place them outside this group, making their relation to Hypsilophodon significantly more distant. While removed from the same family, the two do still share the same clade organization as Iguanodontia, a diverse grouping of herbivorous dinosaurs which included the lubbering Iguanodon and, moving into the Cretaceous, the Hatrosaurs. An accurate full-grown size is difficult to determine, as no adults have ever been discovered for the genus. Estimates based on juveniles believe Dryosaurus would have measured approximately 10 feet or 3 meters in length and reach a height of about 5 feet or 1.5 meters. Based on this size, it probably would have weighed about 200 pounds or 100 kilograms. The head of Dryosaurus was quite small, with large eye sockets indicating this creature had excellent vision most likely for spotting predators. Their mouths ended in a sharp beak, ideal for stripping plants and cutting tough vegetation. Slightly behind this beak was a set of small teeth, some including the previously mentioned leaf-like teeth along the sides of their jaw, ideal for holding and grinding down food. Also in their mouths were supposed cheek-like structures, Cheeks, as we know them today, pockets of stretchy flesh on the sides of mouths, is a common trait among mammals, but their existence in dinosaurs has been a point of discussion for decades. Those who believe that cheek-like structures are possible, one of the most prominent being anatomist Ali Nabavizadeh, believe that rather than stretchy flesh pockets, ugh, should have phrased that better, Herbivores like Hatchosaurs and Ceratopsians had a muscular connection between the lower jaw and the top of their skulls, which would increase their jaw strength and more importantly create a space between their teeth and the edge of their mouth to hold food while chewing. Important to note that this research did not directly apply to Dryosaurus, but due to their relation to Hatchosaurus as fellow Iguanodontia, it is not out of the question. The head of Dryosaurus would be supported by a long neck, ideal for surveying their surroundings to search for threats. Their arms, by contrast, were fairly short and kept close to the body. These short arms ended in five-fingered hands, which were most likely used for foraging when looking for food. Their legs were significantly longer, ideal for helping Dryosaurus reach high speeds with some estimates believing their speed to fall between 20 to 30 miles per hour, or 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. This high speed was most likely their main defense, able to outrun predators or flee to thick foliage to hide. Dryosaurus would have lived during the late Jurassic, almost 160 million years ago. Fossil evidence indicates it would have roamed throughout the modern day United States, particularly states like Wyoming and Utah. The environment of this location and time was a semi-arid one, with distinct wet and dry seasons determining access to vegetation. It is likely this area was divided by various rivers and lakes, creating vast forests and swamps for Dryosaurus to graze and live in. It would likely have lived alongside titanic sauropods, including the towering Brachiosaurus, as well as previous Dinobasic century Diplodocus. Shorter herbivores, such as the Stegosaurus, also would have called this formation home. This area was also prowled by vicious carnivores, including smaller predators like the Ornitholestes, as well as renowned hunters like the Allosaurus. To survive this environment, it is likely Dryosaurus would have lived together in herds or family units, similar to modern-day prairie dogs or elk. This group would provide more eyes to search for predators, as well as increasing survival chances, 
since you don't need to outrun Allosaurus, just outrun the dinosaur behind you. Dryosaurus has been able to land a number of roles in modern media. Much of this owed to its fast speed and small stature, helping it stand out from many of its bulkier, slower counterparts. While not appearing in any of the films, Dryosaurus would appear in various Jurassic Park video games, including 2003's Jurassic Park Operation Genesis, 2012's Jurassic Park Builder, and more recently, in 2018's Jurassic World Evolution, and its 2021 sequel. Besides these park appearances, Dryosaurus has also popped up in documentaries like 1999's Walking with Dinosaurs, and its spiritual successor, 2000's The Ballad of Big Al, as well as in video games, including 2022's Prehistoric Kingdom, and in the Envirma build of The Isle, which is kind of an update to the original Isle, which is now called Legacy, but is honestly more of a revamp or sequel, but when it comes out, it's going to be called The Isle. The dev cycle of this game is weird. The Dryosaurus is an easy dinosaur to overlook. It lived in the shadows of literal giants and hid from the prying eyes of bloodthirsty killers. But to ignore such a creature would be a disservice to what dinosaurs were and what they could be. Sure, some were lumbering behemoths armed to the teeth, but others, like Dryosaurus, were nimble creatures, able to stay one step ahead of their competition. Sometimes many more steps, depending on how fast they ran. The ingenuity and creativity of dinosaurs to evolve and thrive in their environment clearly never ran dry. That's good to do for this episode. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to leave a comment below what you think of Dryosaurus and if you've heard this dinosaur before the video. It's always a surprise to me to see dinosaurs like Eutyrannus and Torvosaurus maybe get three or four appearances in media, yet Dryosaurus can get so many. Like feathered T-Rex or scrawny dinosaur deer. Well, what do I know? Fill your niche and all. Next week, we look into a dinosaur you could never get away with calling scrawny. The mighty Carcharodontosaurus. Thank you for your support, and see you in the next video.